For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. I'm Greg Dalton, host of Climate One from the Commonwealth Club based in San Francisco. I'd like to begin today's conversation about justice and inclusion by acknowledging the Ohlone and Coast Miwok people who inhabited these barrier lands for 10,000 years. Today, we're talking about racism and climate disruption. We'd love to hear from you. So please share your questions in the comment section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. For future Climate One discussions on coronavirus, economic disruption, human behavior, and a just transition to cleaner energy, sign up for our podcast and newsletter at climateone.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast. It drops every Friday and is available wherever you get your pods. Many white people have learned recently how racism is embedded in every aspect of our society. That's been glaringly obvious to people of color their whole lives. Environmental and climate concerns are often viewed as the domain of white people, often coastal, usually affluent. But the reality is quite different. Polls show people of color are more concerned about local pollution because refineries, power plants, and dumps are often in their neighborhoods. Today, we'll talk about the connection between racism and climate change with three distinguished guests. Mustafa Santiago Ali is Vice President of Environmental Justice at the National Wildlife Federation. He began working on social justice issues at the age of 16, and as a student joined the US EPA, where he worked for 24 years. Dr. Robert Bullard is a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University in Houston. Trained as a sociologist, Dr. Bullard is widely recognized as the father of environmental justice and is a recipient of many awards, including the Stephen Schneider Award for Climate Science Communication, presented by Climate One earlier this year. Glinda Carr is president and CEO of Higher Heights for America. She co-founded the organization in 2011 to grow black women's political power from the voting booth to the elected office. In 2018, Essence Magazine included her in its Woke 100 list. Welcome all of you to Climate One. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin today's program with inviting everyone to take a breath. And we want to talk about breath. And just take as long, slow, smooth, deep inhalation and then a long, slow, smooth, complete exhalation. Humans breathe about 25,000 times a day, but what they breathe and how they breathe um, is a lot of racial connotations. COVID attacks the lungs, coal attacks the lungs, and lately police have been attacking lungs. Mustafa Santiago Ali, you often talk about breath in your talks. so. Tell us about the meaning of breath, especially now. Well, you know, breath is life. You know, from the, the moment that we come from our mothers, the first thing we do is take that breath, which brings life um, into our bodies in this world. And unfortunately, we know that so many of our communities, uh, you know, black communities, brown communities, indigenous communities, uh, sometimes even lower wealth white communities, uh, don't have that opportunity. And they don't have that opportunity because there's intentionality um, by folks both in the past and in the present and limiting folks' ability to be able to take that breath. And that's why in this moment, we also talk about that racism, systemic racism uh, plays into that paradigm and to that set of actions. Um, and hopefully today we will unpack what that looks like um, and, and how we can rectify the situation um, that has been perpetuated by both uh, politics, 
policy um, and in everyday folks' lives. Glenda Carr, when you take a long, deep breath, you know, how does that affect you given what's ever, everything that's been happening in our country lately about breathing? Yeah. So recently, a colleague of mine shared a song that her mother-in-law wrote. Um, and it was a song um, in tribute to George Floyd. And in that she says, I can't breathe, let me breathe. I'm sorry, I can't breathe, let me breathe, hear me. Um, and I think those three short phrases um, shares a little bit about how um, African-Americans are feeling in this moment, um, how black and brown communities um, are feeling in this moment and frankly, how the world is feeling. Um, you know, the notion of being able to be free to take a full breath um, and use this moment for those who can to fill up and fill our, our democracy in a way um, that can envision a pathway forward. Uh, it is a luxury, unfortunately, in our society to breathe. Um, the attack on, on Black and Brown lives um, and our ability not, to not only breathe because we've been constrained by institutional racism for centuries. Um, our ability to breathe um, when we continue to see um, police brutality um, choking, you know, choking black lives. Our ability to breathe so we can imagine a world um, rid of, you know, pollution, rid of, um, rid of racism, rid of a politically toxic, racially divisive time that we're living in. Um, but in that moment when we breathe, there's clarity about a pathway forward. Dr. Bullard, your thoughts. You've been writing books with uh, very uh, prescient titles, Dumping in Dixie, The Wrong uh, Complexion for Protection. When you think about breathing and the work you've done, what really fills your mind and your heart? Well, you know, the first thing I think of is that uh, breathing is, uh, natural. And what's unnatural is when breathing can be hazardous to your health. And for too long, um, our, our lives have been snuffed out and, and somehow uh, demeaned because we have not been allowed to breathe freely. And I think the the, this whole idea of the right to breathe uh, clean air is a basic human right. And when you start taking away that right to breathe, you're taking away humanity. And when you're taking away um, just every day, 24-7, uh, the violence of dumping pollution into neighborhoods, through smokestacks and, and families are waking up 2.30 in the morning because some accident, because of some plume that is rushing through their neighborhoods. They don't know if, and they're told to shelter in place and they don't know if they're gonna live or die. That's violence. It's the same kind of violence that we see the police violence that's, that's snuffing out uh, black lives. And, and, and killing people and, and creating um, this mental stress and trauma. When we see those videos daily and running, looping, 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 yeah. that is causing trauma, you know, which is PTSD. That kind of violence is taking its toll. And I think uh, everybody knows it now. These demonstrations are, are really showing that not just in this country, around the world, that this is um, this is unjust, th this is barbaric, and we need to stop it right now. Dr. Bullard, before we go forward, I wanna invite you to do what I'm doing is hold your mic a little bit so that it's, uh, our mics tend to rustle against our, uh, our callers. Uh, that comment, Dr. Bullard, about the plume in the middle of the night reminds me of a Chevron refinery that uh, caught fire uh, in Richmond, California. An investigation showed that there actually had been a bypass that the, that the refinery had, there was a hundred foot bypass to uh, uh, bypass some of uh, the safety monitoring equipment. And um, I don't know that there was ever any accountability uh, for the company for, there was an investigation that 
perhaps may have evaporated in terms of how did that pipe bypass the monitoring equipment and, and who did it and who was who was ever held accountable held accountable for that. Um, Dr. Bullard, you your university uh, is right next to Jack Gates High School where George Floyd went to high school. That's where his there's been some memorial services there recently. So tell us about that school and have, really this is very close to home for you. Well, you have, you have to understand, Jack Yates was was somebody. I mean, this is a former slave who started uh, the first schools in Texas. And Jack Yates in the Third War, Jack Yates um, uh, was was a man. He was a visionary. He saw that black people, uh, once they were freed, need to be educated. And that school sits right next to Texas Southern University, which was founded to educate. Black folks, because we couldn't go to the University of Texas, and so, so when you talk about the history, and you talk about the birth of of um, the school, Jack Gates High School, and Texas Southern University, and the segregation that created, you know, black folks being in one area, Third Ward is a very close knit community, and uh, and so that history and that uh, that uh, solidarity uh, is something that uh, really was uh, lifted up. Uh, not just in the third Houston Third Ward, but across Houston. You know, Houston right now is, uh, for, you know, this past week was uh, ground zero for a lot of this uh, activity in terms of unpacking and dismantling racism, systemic racism, mm -hmm. and owning up to the fact that racism is embedded in America's DNA. Uh, and for 401 years, since 1619, uh, we have somehow... Uh, tried to hide that fact. So, so, so now I think uh, it's out of the box, and I don't think you can put it back in the box. It's like toothpaste. Mustafa Sandir Ali, I was recently listening to an interview with uh, Brian Stevenson, and he was talking about how, you know, going to other countries, particularly, I guess, Germany, how they, you know, the is actively encourage people to learn about the Holocaust. There's this national reckoning across generations. And it seems like this country um, hasn't had that reckoning yet. I remember going to visit a plantation in, uh, in South Carolina once, and it was like you could visit the beautiful grounds of the, uh, of the plantation owner. And there was like a separate, uh, you know, oh, that thing over there, you could see where the slaves lived. It was like an option over there. It wasn't like the main attraction. It wasn't like they were driving people to learn and understand that. I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether America's really put this, our legacy of racism front and center like it should have. Well, I think America's afraid to, because if you put it front and center, if you integrate it into the educational system, um, as a part of our history, both the dark days um, and, and where we are in, in this present moment, then you have to do something about it. And it's very difficult for America to admit that it was a part of genocide uh, for our indigenous brothers and sisters. It's hard for America to also talk about snatching the lives of Africans and bringing them to this country so that you could have free labor. It's difficult for our country to also focus on the fact that they brought uh, Chinese uh, brothers and sisters over here to build the infrastructure on the railroads and then turn their back on them after that and ostracize them. So for America to truly be able to highlight the injustices, the systemic racism that we're talking about today would then mean that you also have to figure out a way that you are going to address both those past and present uh, injustices that continue to happen. And that may come in the form of reparations. That may would definitely come in the form of making sure that there is legislation, both on the federal and the state level, that rectifies those situations. And that also means that there has to be resources placed into that overall equation because words without resources have little meaning. Um, so I think it's difficult uh, for our country uh, up to this moment uh, to be able to actually honor uh, the lives that have been sacrificed so that this country could be in the positioning that it is. But I will also say that this is a new moment, this is a new time, and young people and many others are refusing to have the 21st century look like the previous centuries. So we have to see what that's gonna actually look like. And of course, mobilization, uh, building coalitions 
and, and many of the other uh, aspects that are necessary for true change to happen will have to all come together. Glenda Carr, the, the climate and, and environmental conversation is often separate from the conversations about housing, jobs, equity, those sorts of things. How do you see them as connected? I mean, racism is everywhere and carbon pollution is everywhere. They're both systemic problems, but they're often thought of as separate. Yep. At the end of the day, you know, we will continue to have siloed conversations. I do think for us to step into the mo this moment, where we can truly reimagine an America we can all believe in, we have to look at the intersectionality of this moment. Um, and at the end of the day, black women want what white women want, who want what black men want, who want what white men and our other um, communities of color want. We want economically thriving, educated and healthy, safe communities. Um, and if we could meet you know, in the intersection to be able to talk about the nuances of that and, and, and why we haven't been able to, to achieve that. And part of the reason why we haven't been able to achieve that is because of the ability not to have brave conversations about the inequalities in this country. Um, and so what has happened you know, with the, I think the intersection, when you talk about meeting at the intersection in 2020, we are moving towards a presidential election in November during one of the most politically toxic and racially divisive times. We are in 2020 with the backdrop of COVID-19 and like literally breaking open the racial disparities, um, you know, on mainstream TV and our, um, you know, our social platforms about how COVID-19 um, is impacting communities of color. Then insert, you know, a continued drumbeat on the attack of blackness and then insert and yet another conversation about a uh, about um, the Amy Coopers of the world racializing um, the ability for a black man to walk in Central Park as a bird watcher. That that all of those pieces have now hit an intersection. An intersection that we can truly have conversations about. How do we talk about the intersectionality of raising? Um, you know, raising the next generation of whole Americans. Um, and that has to be a connection about my ability to economically thrive, my ability to ensure that my children are educated, to, um, um, to imagine a world where we are all safe um, and that it's not just the color of our skin that dictates our ability to walk down the street and not be afraid um, of not being able to come home. Mustafa Santiago Ali, you used to work for the Hip Hop Caucus. There's a lot of uh, talk about how Joe Biden needs black voters to, to win in 2020. What do you see there and that connection? And does it connect to the issues we're talking about, environment and climate, or have they been, they've been pushed aside? No, I don't think they've been pushed aside at all. So first, let's say for anyone who is garnering to have the vote, uh, especially of the African-American community, then you have to be authentic uh, in the work that you have done in the past, uh, in the present, and actually framing out what your future is going to look like. Um, so if you're not willing to do that, then you're gonna have a very difficult time uh, in you know, gathering those votes that are so critical. Um, you know, the beauty of working at the Hip Hop Caucus and shout out to Rev Yearwood for helping to you know, actually found that entity, which is, was transformational in its moment uh, when it was founded. And of course today, is needed more than ever, is that you have to reach young people. And one of the ways in being able to accomplish that, of course, is through the arts um, and making sure that activists and artivists um, who are actually engaging, um, learning about the issues and then sharing that with the masses is a critical component that so many organizations do not get right. Uh, and then they wonder why young people, they wonder why people of color are not connected to their work. Well, one, if you don't look like the people who are working in your institution, <laughs> then you got some work to do. But besides that, you actually have to meet people where they are. Rev and I used to say that our work was from the streets to the suites. Um, so we made sure that we were connecting, you know, with all the various folks that are out there. And, you know, I've shared this before, you know, many of us who are here on this call tonight, you know, we know hundreds, sometimes thousands of incredible scientists who are out there who are doing, you know, important work. And if they say something, you might get 10% of the people to pay attention to what they're saying. But if Beyonce says something, if Jay-Z says something, if Chance the Rapper says something, 
you know, and a number of other folks are sharing information because it's coming from an authentic space um, and they can relate to it. So that's why, you know, organizations like the Hip Hop Caucus and even in a broader construct, you know, us utilizing and honoring uh, the artists, you know, who are speaking from their hearts, they're speaking from their souls. That's what connects with people. That's what motivates people. And I think that's something also that you see many politicians clamoring to have. Um, but, you know, you got to come from the places. You got to spend time in the places if you want your message to actually resonate in a real and authentic way. Uh, Dr. Bullard, is Joe Biden connecting in a passionate and authentic way? Some people think he doesn't, he's lost a step, doesn't quite have the energy that he, he used to have. And is he connecting with uh, African-American voters? Well, let me just put it this way. Uh, black people in this country have, have never uh, put all of our hope in presidents saving us. Uh, and 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 have never uh, put all of our hope in white people saving us. And I think it's important that we understand that any politician that's coming for our votes uh, not only need to be authentic, they need to uh, have a track record, and they need to bring people who are from those areas that they want the votes from and not not uh, white people telling uh, us how it feels to be black. The experts that are out there can can all you know, all tell, you know, a white male can tell uh, on a TV program what it what a black woman feels. That kind of paternalism and and racism and classism uh, needs to stop. So let me just answer your question. I think the fact is that Black people are responsible for, for dragging in South Carolina, dragging Joe Biden across the finish line. Black people are responsible for moving the Democratic Party as far it is, as far the far along that it is right now. So let's be clear. When we talk about um, developing uh, a program of lift every voice, a black agenda for America, then that it needs to be more than a 20 page or 30 page um, term paper. And so we need real authentic um, proposals and organizations that have come to the table. That's why uh, a group of us who have been working on environmental justice and environmental racism, transportation, housing, energy, food security, health, et cetera, came together and we have reformed the National Black Environmental Justice Network that we are pushing forward an agenda. We have developed policy papers, strategies. And the idea is that if we have a black agenda for America that's coming out of the Biden team, then that agenda needs to be developed by and for and presented to that team. And that the way that we move the agenda forward is inclusion, not not sloganeering, but real programs. And I think we have enough young people, old people, and people who are concerned about this crisis that we're in right now. 80% of America thinks that we, have, we are out of control. Every social movement that has been successful in this country has had students and young people. I spent my life training, educating, young people and students. And so the this whole idea of getting the word into those elected officials, and it starts at the city council, county commissioner, the legislature, the governor, everything should not be put just 100% of our energy just on the president election. We have to go down ballot and organize and mobilize and educate. There's no substitution for organizing. We used to be the best organizers in the world and people learned from us, took our playbook, and now they're mimicking what we used to do. We have to get back to what we used to do is out organize uh, everybody. Now that's my spiel for today. <laughs> Glenda Card, uh, the Green New Deal once was that rallying cry for 
uh, for the left, certainly on environmental and, and a lot of other equity issues. Does the Green New Deal speak to you? Is it inclusive? Does it uh, uh, espouse the kind of ideals Dr. Bullard just articulated? I mean, I think at the end of the day, uh, Mustafa uh, hit the nail right in the middle, which is how do we actually talk in a way that our neighbors will be able to be part of the, the, the revolution we're looking for. So when we start using the, you know, I call it, you know, inside policy speak about the uh, Green New Deal, my, not only are my family and friends not seeing themselves in that frame, framework, um, I hope everybody's not like, yes. Um, then you wonder, it's like, oh, people aren't with us. We're not growing momentum. It's because we are using, you know, our inside table speak. Um, you know, research points to, as you know, Higher Heights is uniquely focused on um, organizing and mobilizing Black women. So that will be the voice that I will continue to use here. Is So Nielsen rating. Oops. Hope she comes back. Well, until she comes back, uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali, you grew up in Appalachia. You even have talked about how even some of the Obama plans for green recovery from the Great Recession weren't inclusive, didn't reach real people. Yeah, you know, I've often said that anytime policy is being created, it should be coming from uh, local people, local communities, local organizations, um, and should be evaluated by those same organizations to make sure that it's meeting the needs. And we should not necessarily be having people have to come to Washington. You should be in their communities, in their meetings, listening. That's the first thing. Uh, and then sitting down with folks and, and following through with the translation of what they are asking for. And that is true whether we're in Appalachia, we're in the Rust Belt, we're on the Gulf Coast, no matter where we are, we have to make sure that that's actually happening. And I think it doesn't matter what administration it is. You know, folks sometimes fall short. Now, of course, this administration, the, the words falling short does not even begin to equate, um, you know, the lack of understanding, vision, uh, and just the basicness that is needed just for survival. Um, but yes, you know, we have to make sure that we are honoring the voice of the communities. Dr. Bullard um, and many others, when I was coming up, I always remember, you know, sitting outside, listening to the meetings they were having. And the most important thing was that, you know, communities speak for themselves. So if we can get politicians, whether on the federal level or, or the state level or the county or the local level to understand that basic concept, we would stop wasting money and we would stop making mistakes by creating policy that is not meeting the needs of everyday people. Carter Roberts is CEO of WWF, one of the largest conservation organizations in the world with annual revenues of $300 million. After the national response to George Floyd's murder by police, he held an all-staff meeting to discuss the response of the organization, which was founded by European monarchs. I asked him what he heard at that meeting. And we had over 500 people on the phone, on Zoom. Our African-American leaders told stories they'd never told in public before like that, that gave voice to what it was like to have uh, a son or a husband or a nephew that you worried about every day. And mm. they gave voice to the injustice that they face every day. And, um, and the re response of our entire staff was a tidal wave of conviction that we need to do more to address that systemic justice. I grew up in Atlanta in, um, in the city of Martin Luther King and Andrew Young and Ralph Abernathy. And I thought we had made more progress than we have. I've led an organization where we have devoted ourselves to working with indigenous people and communities in far-flung places like the Congo or Namibia or Indonesia or uh, Nepal and Bhutan or here at home in Alaska with tribal corporations and in the northern Great Plains with tribes and ranchers. But it was clear to me we have not done enough with that most unique of American 
narratives and experiences and tension and roots, which is the African American experience. So we have the largest social media presence of any environmental group and the largest brand. Yes, I think of the, you know, the, the, the panda bear, when you mentioned WWF, for some reason, I think of Prince Charles. Yeah, uh, and, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and we sound like an elite group of people saving fuzzy animals, but, um, you know, our, our mission has evolved over time. Alex Ohanian, who's married to Serena Williams, uh, resigned from the board of Reddit, a company that he co-founded and encouraged the board uh, to place a, a black person in his place. He also donated a million dollars to Colin Kaepernick's Know Your Rights Camp. Is it time for some white people on environmental boards to step off and say, replace me with a person of color? I think it's time for white people like myself to ensure that the voices of African-Americans, people of color, indigenous communities are heard. And if that means stepping down from the stage that you're on and, and insisting that someone else take your place. And I think it means um, boards to look in the mirror and, um, and, and see everything they need to do to make sure those voices are heard. I think this begins with listening. That was Carter Roberts, CEO of WWF. Uh, Dr. Bullard, I'd like to hear your response there to basically saying they overlooked people in their own backyard and other things that he said. Well, you know, we have been saying that for decades. And uh, in, in educating students, uh, I've taught at big white schools and I've taught at historically black universities. And I encourage uh, young people to do study abroad. Uh, which is very important. But I also encourage them to explore the, the possibilities of what's on uh, across town. And I think to, for uh, too often, uh, we have overlooked those issues um, that, are, that are close to home uh, and, not, uh, and, and somehow think that America has somehow uh, overcome many of the issues that are being dealt with abroad such as um, uh, poverty and hunger and, uh, and looking at uh, the issues of um, political prisoners, et cetera. Uh, the, the fact that um, we have been also in our environmental justice movement has been talk, have been talking about uh, people speaking for themselves and developing uh, resources that will have the capacity for people to speak for themselves. And we've really chastised uh, a lot of these uh, large um, uh, green groups, or they used to be in the 90s, we call them the Big Ten, for sucking up all the green dollars and uh, from foundations, private foundations, and, and, and supposedly doing the work for everybody. But we know the work that gets done in a lot of communities of color is done by communities of color, indigenous communities that get very little um, share of the, do of the dollars. You know, the studies done in 2002, uh, people called the Environmental Justice Group got 4.5% of the green dollars. Uh, in 2020, I think it's 15%. Uh, in 25 years, this country will be majority people of color. We shouldn't wait to 2045 for us to transition to do justice in terms of not just diversity in terms of these um, large organizations on the boards and the staffs. That's okay. But we also should talk about diversifying the dollars, where the dollars flow should be where the needs are and building those capacities of people of color groups and indigenous groups and women of color groups, et cetera. That's how you make change. And that's what we have been saying for a long time. Green 2.0, looking at diversity and the, and, and the boardrooms and then the boards, et cetera, that's good. Uh, but we also be looking at where the money, as, as uh, folks would say on the street, where the money at? Who's getting them dollars and how that flows? Makes a Mustafa, difference. Mustafa Sanchez Ali, uh, a report by Bloomberg last year found that the fossil fuel industry is much more ethnically diverse than the clean energy sector. The solar industry, for example, has a quarter million workers and about 75% of them are white. A recent academic study found lower adoption of rooftop solar in communities of color even after adjusting for income and home ownership. What's going on there? You know, there's a saying, if you're gonna talk about it, be about it. 
And, you know, it's really interesting that, and I've said this before, and, I, and I've had some pushback from some folks, you know, it's not only workers uh, inside of this new green, clean economy, because that's one, you know, people love for us to be focused on that. And that is an important conversation. The other part of it is ownership, because ownership then means that you can prioritize, you can make the right decisions, um, and, and you can make sure that your services and your resources can then be anchored in certain communities and can revolve around inside of those communities. And that is a missing part of this conversation. It's almost like the conversation that we have, and, and Dr. Bullard touched on it a little bit there, when we look at all the major green groups, we don't see an African-American or a Latinx person leading any of those, but the Heritage Fund or the Heritage, whatever the, 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 the other part of the name is, they actually have an African-American woman who runs that. Now, the Heritage, I don't agree Heritage with Foundation, Foundation, the conservative Foundation, think tank. Yeah. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't agree with the policies that they support and they move forward on. But if they can do it, how is it that these organizations that focus on environmental conservation, climate can't do it? Um, and then, of course, we flip the coin over and we look at the clean economy and we don't see folks doing the right things yet in that space. It's important. The work that can come out of there is important. Us you know, transitioning from fossil fuels is important, but it's also as important that we don't take this, you know, a paradigm from one impacting negative side and then transfer that to the green side. So we got to make sure that we don't, uh, you know, continue the sins of the past, if I can say it that way. Glenda Carr, on that point about the Heritage Foundation, uh, Condi Rice is the new head of the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, very bastion of conservative thinking, uh, you know, going back uh, for, for decades. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you, is there an expectation that uh, women of color are always progressive? Are you happy to get conservative women of color in power too? Um, you know, black women aren't um, a, mon a monolithic voting block. We're not a monolithic leadership. Um, and for me, a diverse decision-making table, regardless of where it fits in my, my, my political ideology still makes better decisions. Um, and so being able to ensure that if we're looking at this just from a, from a, from a two, two, um, two political, two political idealism um, spectrum, conservative to progressives, we need to be pushing both, um, <laughs> both um, spectrums to ensure that their leadership looks diverse and looks like America. Um, and then for, for me is that I have no problem being able to be in, um, in a brave, conversation where we put push our counterparts um, to be better on issues or center center our communities in those issues. So um, no, I think that we should ensure that each decision making table is is diverse um, so that um, th she still has uni a unique experience as a black woman in America that she's bringing to a table that um, would without her leadership be void of a discussion about race and gender. And another person that you've helped uh, uh, campaign, Letitia James, the first black woman to be a New York attorney general. She took on ExxonMobil and lost. Tell us about her and some of the other new crop of leaders you're, you're supporting. We saw a very different congressional glass in 2018. Yeah. Hopefully I don't drop <laughs> again. I was like, I'm saying great things. Why can't y'all hear me? <laughs> Just so you know, it was great. You didn't hear it, but it was great. Uh, <laughs> So at the end of the day, you know, um, behind my shoulder is Shirley Chisholm, um, the first black woman to ever be elected to Congress in 1968. So we're 51 years since she, um, you know, became the first black woman to serve in that body. She went on, you know, four years later to um, literally 48 years from like today, she was preparing for the Demo 1972 Democratic Convention where she would go and her name be entered um, into nomination from the floor. Um, so there's been gains around black leadership since then and gains for black women, but the 23 million black women in this country are underrepresented and underserved. And the strides that we've seen since Shirley Chisholm is in um, through Higher Heights and our work with the Center for American Women in Politics, you can't actually build a blueprint for if you don't know where you've been, Sankofa, 
right? And so when you look at Black women's leadership, in 2014, there was only one, two Black women elected and serving as mayors of top 100 cities. So enter 2020 and what we see on the national stage are seven Black women leading major cities and, and frankly being more progressive on how they're approaching COVID-19 than their counterparts across the country. Um, in our country's history, we've um, only had 15 Black women serve as state ex statewide executives, Letitia James being one, right? And here is a woman who is using her position as a New York State Attorney General to actually put, push innovation um, and progressive policies that will be implemented nationwide. And so she again entered COVID-19 recognizing the racial disparities both from a health perspective, from um, an economic perspective, and um, I think has leading well. Um, and to circle right back to a Shirley Chisholm, in 2018, we elected the largest number of women ever to serve in Congress, including the largest number of Black women to ever serve in that body. Um, we now have 25 Black women serving in Congress, one uh, African-American woman in um, the U.S. Senate, which is Kamala Harris. We've only elected two in our country's history in 1972, um, Carol Mosley Braun and now um, Kamala Harris. And we have 24 Black women serving in the House of Representatives. But what's unique about the freshman class is they were, um, their leadership was built for a time as this. So who did we know that in 2018 we would elect Lauren Underwood, a nurse, who is uniquely qualified to sit at a table as we determine how we are preparing in the intersection of um, a racial lens around um, health disparities. Who knew that in 2018, when we sent Johanna Hayes, not only a teacher, but the 2016 Teacher of the Year to serve in Congress, that she would be sitting at a table that as we envision how we homeschool um, children across the country, that we would ensure that there would be a, a clear discussion, um, discussion around the inequalities of broad, broadband um, to, and technology for our children. So I think the Black women you know, that are serving in Congress are uniquely um, using their voices and their leadership in a way that centers the um, communities of color in the way that talks about the intersectionality of the very issues that we are at the um, you know, unfortunate bottom of every indicator. Um, at the end of the day, I will end up at this. Um, this is one of the things that I was talking about when my internet dropped, <laughs> is that the road to 2020 um, is built on um, the over the engagement of Black voters. And at the center of the over-engagement of um, Black voters are Black women. When we fire up a Black woman, she doesn't go to the polls alone. She brings her house, her block, her church, and her sorority. That is the tradition of what my mother did. And to the day she died, she called me and my brothers to ensure that we voted in elections, right? Um, and we are... Um, more than ever leaning into, we want our return on our voting investment. And that is in the form of policies that directly impact Black women, our families, and our communities. And we are absolutely continuing to claim seats at decision-making tables so that we can create a country and move it to higher heights. If you're just joining us, we're talking about racism and climate at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Glinda Carr, president and CEO of Higher Heights for America. She co-founded the nonprofit in 2011 to grow Black women's political power from the voting booth to elected office. Dr. Robert Buller, a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University, who fought, recognized as the father of environmental uh, justice, and Mustafa Santiago Ali, Vice President of Environmental Justice at the National Wildlife Federation. He worked at the US EPA for 24 years. We're going to go to a lightning round and invite you to, to talk about this uh, one part. First, I'm going to ask you a true or false question. Just ask, please, true or false, and then I'll ask you an association. So going to our lightning round, true or false, Dr. Robert Bullard, Having a racist and violent police force in your neighborhood is a lot like having a coal-fired power plant in your neighborhood. True. That's uh, Bill McKibben for that one. Uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali, uh, true or false, you adopted white characteristics sometimes to fit in at US EPA. False. Uh, Glinda Carlin, and I think we have uh, Glinda, if you can please, let's see. Ask her to move your mic out front. I think, yeah, uh, Arnav's asking you to, got it, okay. Um, Glinda Carr, true or false, you will enthusiastically support Joe Biden even if he doesn't pick a woman of color as his running mate. False. 
Uh, true or false, Dr. Bullard, white women clutch their purses when you are in the elevator with them. True. Uh, also, Dr. Bullard, really, it's black people who should fear white people, given history. Very true. Uh, <laughs> this is association. I'm going to mention uh, one word or phrase and just get your the f- one phrase that comes off the top of your mind, unfiltered, when I mention Glinda Carr, when I mention Angela Davis. Powerful. Also for Glinda Carr, Amy Cooper. Typical. She's the woman who called 911 in Central Park. Mustafa Santiago Ali, what comes to mind when I say 1619? Slavery. Slavery. Uh, Dr. Bullard, what comes to mind when I say Ida B. Wells? Fighter. Investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. Glinda Carr, what comes to mind when I say defund the police? Innovative. Uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali, what comes to mind when I say Greg Glassman, the CEO and founder of CrossFit? Uh, Healthy. Yeah, he didn't get a lot of news, but he... uh, Sponsors are leaving CrossFit because he said that he's not mourning for George Floyd. Uh, Why should I mourn for him other than it's the white thing to do? That was Greg Glassman from CrossFit. Uh, Dr. Bullard, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say Colin Kaepernick? Oh, one word. It's hard. One Uh, phrase. Hero. 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 Uh, Last one, Glinda Carr, what comes to mind, one word or phrase, when I say the NFL? Complicated. All right. Thank you for uh, getting through the lightning round here on Climate One. Um, Glinda, you talk about creating space for grace and having this difficult, you said brave conversation because it's, you know, we're not comfortable talking about race in this country. And part of that is what words to use. Um, so you prefer, you were born in the USA. Your father's from Jamaica. What are your thoughts on how white people should say? Should we say black? Should we say African-American? Help me, help me understand that. Yeah, so the African diaspora is, is diverse. Um, and, you know, I ha- am blessed to have um, been raised by parents that believe that um, it is okay to have brave conversations. So, you know, Higher Heights, we have um, built the political home for Black women's leadership. Um, and to be clear, it's center, it is, it was founded for and by Black women, it centers Black women, but we recognize that this, dim- this, dim- this democracy is more than Black women. And so part of the reason why we use the analogy of being a home, for those who know the tradition of Black women, my grandmother, regardless of how much money she had or had not, didn't have, there was always an extra seat at her dinner table, right? And it didn't matter who our brothers, my brothers and I would bring home. Um, You know, we grew up in Connecticut. Um, We always joke around for some people like there are black people in Connecticut. (laughs) Um, And, you know, although we, we grew up in a black community, we were bust to an affluent white school district. Um, you know, we, I graduated from a high school with less than 10 people of color. And so we found ourselves very early being centered in a very Afrocentric and Caribbean centric um, family, being bust and um, our parents being very clear that we had to show our authentic selves. And, um, and the way you show your authentic selves is allowed there to be grace when someone says something that is offensive and being able to have what, as my mother would say, teachable moments. Um, I remember in sixth grade, we, myself and two um, of my um, closest friends, th- there were three black girls in my sixth grade class. And I'm not gonna, I almost called man's name out. <laughs> Our teacher at the time, we were doing a, um, a family tree and he pulled the three black girls out of the class to tell us we didn't have to do the family tree. Because he was, you know, assumed that we couldn't do a family tree as descendants of African and those who were brought here from slaves. So, of course, all of our parents took it upon themselves to actually do the family trees for us. (laughs) It was the best family tree ever. And for them, it's like, no, 
here's an opportunity for you to know the diversity of our families. But he did that because he thought he was being, didn't want us to be uncomfortable. It was in fact, he didn't want his white students for him to be uncomfortable for if at the end of the day, we could only stand in front of that class and proudly say we were descendants of slaves, that that was the ability for in sixth grade to understand that being uncomfortable is the way that we have real conversations. And I think that is what we ought to be doing in this moment to be able to have, to, to listen, as you said, um, but also to be able to be receptive to conversations and the grace for people to evolve um, around a race conversation. Dr. Bowen, what do you say to people who would like to be a white ally? That's a term that we've heard a lot about lately and how the complexion of the protest has, has changed. A lot of younger people, younger white millennials, for example, what do you say to someone who wants to be a white ally and isn't sure what language to use or how to go about it? Well, you know, the, the fact that coming out of the environmental justice movement and civil rights movement, uh, we don't ask uh, uh, white people to check their, white, their, their skin color at the door, but we do ask them to come with a lens that's a uh, racial justice and equity lens. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the, the meeting that we had at the University of Michigan uh, in 1990 was, uh, was pulled together by uh, uh, Bunyan Bryan and Paul Mohai, an African-American and a white guy. And, and, and so the idea that we have ha always had allies, but the fact is that when we talk about um, the issues around justice, fairness, and equity, uh, there's no one uh, group that will have a monopoly on that. And so how we build allies is to come to the table with uh, being authentic, coming there being, being uh, sincere and coming to work. And I think this is true with young people today. And as I said, uh, every social movement has had successful movement that had young people and students. And young people, millennials, for, for example, today outnumber my generation, baby boomers. And then you start going below the millennials, younger than the millennials, you, you find this mobilization, this awareness. And because of, of, of uh, iPhones and, cell, and iPads and being able to, you know, the social media to get information, access to Google something real quick, the, the amount of information that young people have at their disposal in real time, they can, they can um, uh, truth what you call it when you are testing a lie, uh, they can fact check instantly and, and really show, no, that's not true. Here are the facts. And so building allies, building that intergenerational uh, collaborative and, and understanding that when we are working together as a collective, we, we are unstoppable. And, and those of us who've been doing this a long time, if again, if we look at this race as a, not a sprint, but more of a marathon, and as a matter of fact, it's a race that doesn't really exist, a marathon relay. You run your 26.2 miles and then you pass the baton off to the next generation to run it. Those, those young people that are out there marching, demonstrating and protesting and, and showing their bravery during this time of coronavirus, during this time when they could know that they could get beat up, brutalized or killed by police. That that kind of of um, sheer bravery, but also standing for something uh, that that that's who we were in the 60s in terms of being fearless in terms of dogs, fire hoses, going to jail, uh, threatened with your life. But to see the but to see those televised lynchings by police today, it's it has it, it it struck a nerve and it and it's hit a nerve among a lot of people, not just black people, a lot of people. And I think this is that teachable moment that Glenn was talking about, that we have to use that teachable moment to teach. And 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 people who are open to learning and changing. That to me, uh, that's the optimism uh, that that I uh, that I have for uh, what's going on right now. 
Linda Carr, we've seen moments in the past where school shootings, for example, and Dr. Bullard thought that, you know, uh, after Sandy Hook, the culture would change on school shootings and uh, it didn't. Uh, and after, uh, you know, uh, the, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, Parkland, it didn't. Um, but somehow this moment seems bigger, more of a movement than even what we've seen for, for school shootings and other things that also cut across race and class in many ways. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think we're at this moment because of what has, you know, it has been a steady build. Um, and I, you know, still don't know what was, you know, May 25th, um, what made that day different, what made George Floyd the catalyst. Um, all I know, I think I shared with you, Greg, that, you know, you know, I think we all are struggling with like processing this moment. Um, and one thing that, you know, um, brought the despair of the moment, but the hope of the moment was when um, his six-year-old, George Floyd's six-year-old daughter proclaimed to the world that her daddy changed the world, mm -hmm. right? And that mm -hmm. is how they were able to, you know, help this six-year-old process all of the energy, what was happening. I mean, she's young enough where I think they've been able to shield her from what actually happened. Um, and obviously at one point she will know and unfortunately see. Um, but I do think that that resonates about that that moment in time, a man, you know, I have um, a brother who's a, mus a, a musician and a gospel musician, um, you know, our faith shows that here, this, this man had no clue, went throughout his life knowing that his, in his death, that he brought back change, he, he brought um, forth change um, and that there was something bigger, unfortunately for him in death than it was in life. Um, and for this little, little girl standing on the top of her, you know, her uncle's um, shoulders to be able to proclaim that to the world mm -hmm. creates the light that allows us to continue to do this work. Mustafa Santiago Ali, you work with the National Wildlife Federation, which is sometimes called the hook and bullet crowd. You know, you think of uh, kind of a white man in plaid with a shotgun. You know, how are, how are you work reaching out to those people to connect on environmental issues? And can you talk to them about environmental justice issues? Well, you know, we just had a, a vote at our board meeting and 97 percent of the board was in favor of the environmental justice movements uh, that we're going forward on. We are the only organization that has a full environmental justice analysis that's taking place for all of its policy programs, activities, and budgeting decisions. So those are important steps. But you know, we also got progressives that are part of the base, the six million members, and you got the good old boys and good old girls who are part of it also. So what I do is I just keep it real with folks. That same pollution that is killing black and brown folks um, in the city is the same pollution that is impacting the national parks that you say that you care about so much. So you should be standing in solidarity with the folks who are dealing with the initial impacts because you're getting the secondary impacts. When we talk about water quality issues, we go through the impacts that are happening again in black and brown and indigenous communities. And that's the same pollution once again that is impacting if you're a fisherman. Um, so there is those intersection points that exist um, you just have to make the decision if you want to stand in solidarity with those who've been doing the work for decades or not. Uh, and we're lucky that, uh, no, we're not lucky. There's work that has been done by folks long before I ever got there uh, to plant the seeds. Um, so, you know, we are continuing to water those uh, and, and move forward. Dr. Bullard, uh, obviously issues of class are also wrapped up in race and, you know, academia, there's sort of a hierarchy of these ultra elite institutions, uh, and then the historically black universities and colleges where you are and others uh, leaders come out of. Um, do you have contempt or anger toward the elite institutions, you know, how they've approached environmental justice? Uh, no, uh, uh, easy answer. Uh, the, the fact that uh, I have, you know, chosen to, you know, uh, work at, uh, Texas Southern University, and before that, uh, Atlanta University. Atlanta University was changed to Clark Atlanta University, my alma mater, University of California, Berkeley, UC Riverside, UCLA. Um, the, the universities that were founded um, as white universities, uh, they, uh, they have a mission. And 
I think that those of us who work with faculty members at those schools, uh, we have very good partnerships, very uh, good collaboration. Students at those universities now are beginning to um, wake up and and force their universities to their boards to divest, you know, from fossil fuels. Many of them are forcing their boards to uh, declare what their role has been in slavery, like George. Well, maybe I shouldn't call any names, but the initials of Georgetown University in D.C. Uh, and and other schools that that uh, basically have built their their fortunes off of slavery or other kinds of uh, issues. And so the, the 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 whole idea is that when we get collaborations and work uh, on justice issues, uh, it is not by accident that the first environmental justice centers that were founded in the '90s were at black schools, and that was because those of us who decided to leave the white school and go back to our HBCUs and start these centers. And now we have centers, uh, environmental justice centers, uh, environmental uh, legal clinics at, at white schools. So we're making progress. And, and again, uh, I think it's the, those institutions uh, uh, need to step up because they uh, step up more because they have huge endowments. And I think they need to uh, uh, own that history uh, and uh, and where there there's a need for uh, reparations and repairing the damage that was done uh, uh, decades ago, in some cases more than centuries centuries ago, uh, need to they need to uh, uh, be held account. And uh, and and students who go to um, uh, uh, predominantly white uh, institutions need to know their history of those institutions. And students who go to historically black universities also need to know their history. And uh, Hispanic serving institutions, as well as uh, 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 native indigenous serving institutions. And our history uh, can, can, can uh, teach us what our mission is, but, uh, but we can also expand it beyond uh, what happened in the past and, and push forward uh, students with visions that can, that can change the world. And, uh, and I think that's uh, where we are right now. And I think it's important that we fight for resources for our HBCUs that have been hit especially hard by, by the recession and the stay home and the coronavirus. We get our students, uh, many of our schools uh, generate their, their um, income and from, from uh, tuition. We don't have large endowments, et cetera. So, so, so we have to fight to make sure that we keep these schools going. We get our students uh, uh, back and that we make sure that we have scholarships and grants for students and, uh, and, 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 the, and these loans uh, that are uh, piled on top of these students, all students uh, need to be forgiven uh, and, 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 and work to uh, make sure that uh, we educate uh, everybody. You know, everybody you know, doesn't have to go to college, but we need to make sure that people or have access to community colleges and to training to get skills. Now that's our education that goes beyond just um, saying, well, we, we want quality education for everybody. Everybody wants that. It's for the details, the devil's in the details. Glenda Carr, a lot of your work is getting people off the sidelines into elected office. We've seen recently, uh, you know, since George Floyd's murder, uh, organizations, elite organizations at the San Francisco Opera, the PGA, the PGA had a moment of silence. Uh, when, when's the last time? I can't remember seeing that organization do something like that. Um, and also some cultural icons, Michael Jordan, you know, who had the famous line, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too, when he wouldn't sort of step into a U.S. Senate race in North Carolina, where there was a black man, Harvey Gantt, running against Jesse Helms. Uh, which I saw in the, the excellent Last Dance documentary. Now, Michael Jordan, $100 million to social justice. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about people, you know, this moment of people who've been, been on the sidelines, getting engaged in their cultural power. Yep. I think, again, going back to grace, it is it, it takes something personal to, to have people step people off the sidelines, right? There's research that points at least to black women or why, you know, women, why they run for office. It's, you know, three reasons. One is something made them mad, <laughs> you know, that they could see the, uh, a difference if somebody asked them. And so I think that is the same thing about people that are making first time major donations or, you know, again, LeBron James and a group 
of um, um, NBA players are forming a, you know, a political advocacy organization for the first time. Um, it is about, frankly, not over the, the, the hundred million dollar investments, what we've seen over the last um, two and a half weeks is millions of dollars being um, donated, mostly grassroots, you know, five, ten dollars from hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and just watching my personal feed, a lot of this are some of my white friends who are making their first donation to an organization with a racial lens. Um, and frankly, some of my um, Black friends and colleagues making contributions to different organizations outside their network. At the end of the day, it goes back to what Dr. Bullard said. Here is an opportunity actually to build a, um, to invest in black and brown leadership. Our organizations have often done um, the work on a shoestring budget when our counterpart organizations have not, right? And so just because we do it with $1 doesn't mean we should have to do it with $1. And so as I struggle with this um, movement building moment of money being um, 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 pushed into these black led organizations. It can't just, just be um, a, an emotional res, um, response. We need to actually create an investment strategy. And so you use you know, Michael Jordan as example. It's a hundred million dollar investment over three years. That is how you institutional institution bill. I would, you know, encourage those who have been sending, you know, I call, we call it the political budget, right? So we tithe. Um, and so we should be tithing into our political engagement. And so I encourage those who have been moved over the last two and a half weeks, who may have clicked through to do $5 or $100 to consider taking those organizations and actually investing in monthly um, reoccurring contributions. That is how these organizations won't just have an influx moment, where they'll be able to do great work for the next six months. Um, and then the day after the election, right? I, I get, here's, here's my um, analogy to give. Oftentimes our um, white led organizational partners, they get money to go fishing, right? The, 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 the grace to be able to innovate. Organizations, black led organizations, oftentimes I'll give you the two examples that at least we know about through Higher Heights is there was this influx moment when um, everyone said, thank black women for saving the world yet again in 2017 in the Alabama Senate race. And there was all this money that was sent to black led political organizations. At the end of the day, those organizations got money to go fishing. I mean, to, to fish, not to go fishing, which is in that moment, there was something that our, um, our progressive counterparts wanted us to go fish for fish that we agree on versus saying, I'm going to invest in your leadership and your vision. Um, and that is what we need in this moment is how do you, how are you inspired to institutional build and to actually invest in the next um, generation of leaders across all of the different um, um, issue areas we've talked about today? Mustafa Santiago Ali, you know, unions have been uh, focused on as one of the obstructions to accountability uh, in police departments, police unions, uh, typically supported by, by people on the left. And then unions are often uh, supporters of fossil fuel infrastructure and often, you know, can oppose uh, green infrastructure. So I'd like to hear about your work and outreach with unions. Um, it's a very complicated relationship. Well, I come out of a family uh, of union workers, both in coal mines and in factories, um, grew up, you know, on, on picket lines and a number of other things. So I, I know the value that unions bring. Unions help to actually get a living wage, you know, long before people were utilizing that term. Um, but unions can also, um, when, when not focused and when not connected with what the needs are beyond their own personal set of actions, or their organizational actions um, can can fall short. Uh, we see it happen with the police unions and the contracts that they're putting in place um, that you know stop people from getting information that protect folks you know who have brutalized uh, folks of color. Um, so that has to be addressed. But I also you know I'm, I'm very clear also that uh, the unions um, on the clean energy side. We need to make sure that there are unions for those uh, jobs in, in that industry as well. So I do the work, you know, through engagements with all kinds of folks, whether, you know, it's the Blue Green Alliance type folks or, or others, uh, helping them to understand that, 
you know, if we're truly going to create a, a new economy and that new economy is a clean economy and even broader than that, then there's got to be real accountability. Um, and you'll get more support if people feel that you are connected not only to their struggle, but also to their set of opportunities they see to create, you know, a better future. Great. Thank you, Mustafa. Also, uh, for Mustafa, I just want to ask you, uh, you started on the first uh, environmental justice uh, program at the US EPA under uh, Administrator Bill Riley, who under the first President Bush. Um, and you left to, I think, protest the leadership of Scott Pruitt. Um, what is the status of the environmental justice program now at EPA? So much has been devastated in that agency. Yeah, well, you know, the Office of Environmental Justice, which Dr. Bullard and others helped to get founded, which was the Office of Environmental Equity, you know, used to be a national program office. So just like the Office of Air, the Office of Water, so forth and so on. Now it's been moved over into the administrator's office about three levels down. Um, and that sends a clear message. That sends a message that uh, environmental justice is no longer a priority um, at this um, institution, but it sends a broader message. It actually sends ripples across the federal family because that office also played a role with the interagency working group. So there are 17 federal agencies and departments that have a distinct responsibility for environmental justice. Um, so when EPA does what it does, which of course is coming from the White House, then it also ripples to these other agencies saying that EJ is no longer a priority issue for us as it was to a degree in the last administration. Um, so, you know, we have to make sure that we're getting these types of things in check. Um, and especially in the broader context of not just the EPA, because these other agencies and departments have much deeper pockets and they have the ability to actually help to address many of these issues in a holistic fashion that are going on inside of our communities. As we get to the end here, I want to touch on empathy and, and grace. Uh, Dr. Bullard, uh, you are a former uh, Marine and the men in your family all served in the armed forces. And we've heard so much of lately of say their names for victims of police violence. That's right, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, so many, Fernando Castile, George Floyd. Um, there's other names, there's a name I came across this weekend when I visiting family of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler, 38 years old, uh, sheriff in, in Santa Cruz, California, who ambushed and killed by an Air Force sergeant. Uh, sergeant D Gutzweiler has a baby on the way. No one knows his name. And what would you say to people on the law and order side, say about what about officers killed in the line of duty? Well, you know, having served in the Marine Corps, um, and and you put your life on the line and you uh you serve and police officers uh do the same and uh the problem is the culture within the police department many police departments that oftentimes uh will take hold of those officers uh not all of them but many of them that culture within um police uh, run to danger. Uh, if you're in the military, you are running to take that heel. You're running forward to take that heel. You're running forward to push the enemy back. Uh, but in terms of uh, when someone is killed, whether it's in the military or in the um, police department, killed uh, 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 in, in the act of service, uh, it's a tragedy. It's a terrible thing. It's a loss. And uh, nobody's shouting, clapping, uh, and 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 throwing uh, confetti in terms of celebration because it is a loss. Because that's a life that's lost, and a family that uh, 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 that has to go without that that loved one. Um, and at the same time, uh, no, we don't see celebrations when uh, when a police officer is killed. Uh, we don't have uh, big demonstrations. We don't have the same thing when when uh, Air Force. Um, uh, person or an army person or Navy person or a Marine Corps person uh, get, gets killed in, in, in line of duty. What we say is uh, we thank you for your service. And so the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm making these two comparisons because um, the, the idea uh, is that the loss of life is something um, uh, that is, you know, a life is cherished. 
and 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 we should not take uh, uh, that loss of life uh, as something that's just you know as nothing. Uh, and 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 that loss is is uh, is something that will be grieved and 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 thought for uh, you know forever in terms of the family. But oftentimes those those names are put on the wall and and they're called heroes and and then uh, they're pretty much forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, like the like the soldiers that die and in the wars that we've had, they're they're put on a wall and and uh, you only remember them when you go and visit the monument. Mm-hmm. Um, but the living, breathing uh, justice of uh, of uh, trying to serve and protect that has to go on, whether it's in the military or whether it's in the in the police department. And that's where I think people are calling for, you know, the justice and uh, and not uh, and not belittling or berating or somehow minimizing uh, the loss of life when police uh, do uh, lose their lives or or somehow are injured. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think that's that's important. I'm going to end with uh, two questions from uh, YouTube, both Sharon and Susan ask, what gives you hope to continue to do this very critical work? And do you have hope that we will actually move forward to equality? Glinda, what gives you hope? Um, so I don't have children of my own, uh, of my own um, but my godchildren um, give me hope. It is about ensuring that we are, li- you know, leaving in America that is better than what we came from. Like I... Um, had the um, uh, privilege of growing up with um, three, gen- four generations in my family. My great grandmother, who was born in 1895 and died shy of her hundredth birthday, um, Carrie Lee Dickens. Um, we all lived in the same community, and so she dreamt a dream bigger for me and my brothers that she could have ever imagined. Right, or that we could have ever imagined. Here's a woman that didn't have a right to own property, that only had a third grade education, um, but she knew that she could use her voice and her activism in a way that created a pathway better for me and my brothers. And I'll leave this um, with you because you brought her name up, Greg, which was Ida B. Wells. She once said, the way you, um, the way you right a wrong is to turn the light of truth on it. And I think that is what we continue to do and strive for. Mustafa, what gives you hope? Seeing so many different types of people coming together in, in authentic ways. Uh, and seeing people not just utilize words, but actually being willing to put their bodies on the line uh, to make sure that justice becomes a reality, that systemic racism ends. It reminds me of the pictures that I've seen because I wasn't there at the time of the early days of the environmental justice movement in Warren County, North Carolina, when people were literally willing to lay down in the roads to stop trucks from coming into their communities. That level of dedication um, is what is the fire underneath of a movement. Um, and, and I'm just blessed to be in, alive at this time and to be able to be a part uh, of change that is actually happening. Dr. Bullard, last word on hope. Well, what gives me hope is that uh, young people uh, that are fearless and willing to commit and, 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 and risk it all for the, the sake of justice and dismantling this violent system of racism. And, uh, and I see that happening uh, uh, right now. And uh, I, I think this is, this is the time uh, to allow that, uh, that space and that leadership to, uh, to, trans- to transition and transform uh, this country. It's enough of them to do it and enough of us together to do it. On Climate One today, we've been discussing racism and carbon pollution that are embedded everywhere in our society and daily lives. We've heard how healing the climate that supports human civilization must include healing racial divides endemic in this country since the first slaves arrived in shackles in 1619. We also heard how people of color suffer the impacts of carbon pollution first and worst. They are more vulnerable to harmful impacts of COVID, climate, and the cops. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests today were um, Dr. Robert Bullard, who's a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University in Houston, and Glinda Carr, president and CEO of Higher Heights for America, 
Mustafa Santiago Ali, Vice President of Environmental Justice at the National Wildlife Federation. If you'd like to get uh, podcasts of other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody.